Okay, so let's move along here and talk for a minute about um, itemized deduction. Several proposals to mess around with the itemized deduction. Number one is capping the value of itemized deductions at 28%. So right now, depending on whatever tax bracket you're in, if you're in the 37% tax bracket, a itemized deduction is worth 37% to you. Um, now this is assuming you itemize and not the standard deduction. Uh, under the Biden proposal, all itemized deductions would be capped at 28%. So effectively, if you're in greater than the 28% tax bracket, you would lose the benefit of those tax deductions. And so it really reduces the value of those deductions, um, you know, things like charity, mortgage interest, those type of things that aren't limited right now, it reduces the value of those to 28%. Uh, there's actually some talk of people that um, no matter what, no matter what bracket you're in is, is sort of evening that playing field with those, with those itemized deductions. But certainly people in the higher brackets, uh, you would want to accelerate those deductions. If we think this is going to take place, you're going to want to take those deductions today. And you'll see the donor advised fund. If this comes to pass and you're, you have any charitable inclination whatsoever, uh, the popularity of donor advised funds, which are very popular today, you'll see explode to try to get those charitable deductions in before the value limitation is capped at 28%. Um, there's also discussions of re removing the SALT cap. The SALT cap is the state and local tax cap of $10,000 that was put in place. Um, of course, people in higher state tax states, um, you know, they can only take $10,000 of income tax deduction for all those state taxes that they pay. And so there's a big push by, you know, states like California and New York and Illinois um, to repeal that, that cap on those, on the SALT limitation. Other places, you know, Florida, Tennessee, Texas, that has no state income tax, you know, they don't really care um, because they don't get any benefit from it anyway. Uh, the other itemized deduction thing that's being bandied about is we're bringing back what's called the Pease limitation. The Pease limitation was named after um, Senator Pease, I think, or was he a congressman? I think it was Senator uh, Pease that uh, instituted a cap. So anyone that makes over $400,000 would have loses essentially some of their itemized deductions. So not only would someone that makes over $400,000 be capped at 28% benefit for those deductions, but if they brought back the P's limitation, they would actually lose some of those um, deductions. And the old P's rules, it was about 3% of their itemized deduction. It may not say, sound like a lot, but still it's another one of those little tricky rules that you have to keep up with. Um, just kind of in general, the whole standardized deduction rules, itemized deductions, it, it is an area that gets played a lot of political football with um, back and forth. I really wish they would simplify it, eliminate a lot of the um, itemized deductions. I know that the higher standard deduction was a great uh, great simplification. Of course, the National Association of Realtors is against that because of the home mortgage interest deduction. And then, of course, some people feel like it hurts charities if you don't have the charitable deduction. So those are big lobby, um, you know, deductions that go back and forth. And depending on who's in power, um, those get bandied about a lot. But there's a lot of changes that typically take place in that itemized deduction arena. Over on the business side, once again, talking about phasing out the qualified business income deduction for anyone above $400,000. So the qualified business income deduction gives a 20% deduction from business income for business owners. Uh, there are ones that don't get it, like what's called a specified service business, like financial advisors, accountants, doctors, lawyers, people like that. Their deduction has already been phased out, but your manufacturers, um, you know, companies like that could have a de unlimited deduction. Oh, actually, it's not unlimited, but they weren't capped by the amount of income they had. They were limited to 50% of the wages that they play paid employees, but it did not cap out. Under the Biden administration proposal, the Q QBI would be eliminated for anyone, no matter what kind of business they were in, if they make over $400,000 a year. 
once again, I think you see a lot of people and a lot of businesses making, uh, you know, in the $390,000 range, miraculously, if this law becomes, uh, or if this proposal becomes law. And that's typically the way things do is, um, you know, there's a law that comes out, you get a bunch of smart tax people like us, <laughs> attorneys, people like that, and we figure out legal ways to, to minimize people's tax bill. Um, you know, the day that somebody comes in and says, hey, David, you know, I'd really like to pay more tax, we'll stop worrying about this stuff. But that's just not the reality. Clients come in all the time and say, hey, I'd like to pay less tax. Uh, they all want to do it legally. If they want to do something that crosses the line, you know, we'll, we'll ask them to leave. We're not going to get into that. But certainly within legal realm, there's always strategies to minimize um, your tax bill. All right. So those were some of the income tax things. I want to talk, the last couple of things are really expansions of, of credits. So the first proposal out there is the expansion of the earned income tax credit to people over 65 with no children. So the earned income tax credit has typically been for lower earning people with children. And it was a way to give them money. Uh, it was a, we will call it a refundable tax credit, meaning that they could just get money for nothing. Um, it was a, a form of a way that government could get money to people other than, you know, food stamps or some other government program. They did it through refundable tax credits. And the earned income tax credit was one of those methods to get lower income taxpayers. Well, they're not taxpayers. They generally don't pay any tax. They get money when they file the tax return. And, by the, and this would expand that to people over age 65 that don't have any kids, essentially like a Social Security supplement type thing while they're still working. Now, one thing, the earned income tax credit is the number one abused area of the tax code. You know, people think it's, you know, millionaires, billionaires, Donald Trump, whatever. The reality is the number one abused area of the tax code is the earned income tax credit um, is where most of the fraud takes place is people filing fraudulent returns to get money back from the government that they're not entitled. So we got to be careful with this stuff, but certainly um, if someone over 65 is still working and, and has a modest income, that's what this would be for. Uh, the next one is expanding the dependent care credit. So for families that have uh, both spouses working and are, have their children in some type of um, daycare, school, preschool, that kind of thing, um, the limits would go from 3,000 per child, 6,000 a family, all the way up to 8,000 and 16,000 per family. And the reimbursement percentage would go from a maximum of 35% to 50%. And what that does, it effectively um, allows people to reach that threshold of the maximum credit they can get with a lower outlay from their pocket uh, for actual child care costs. Um, not, nothing for you to do here, um, no planning, you either qualify for it or you don't. Uh, it's not a full credit dollar for dollar, so if you don't have to pay that for your child, don't go out and pay it to get a 50% uh, tax credit on that. It makes no sense whatsoever. Same thing with the expanded child tax credit. Uh, if you don't have kids, don't have kids just for the expanded child care tax credit, trust me. Kids are a lot more expensive than the two or proposed $3,000 tax credit that you're going to get uh, from the government. Once again, they would make that, um, they want to make that also fully refundable um, as well, expanding that child tax credit. And then another one, a flashback to the Great Recession. Those of you that remember, there was a first time home buyers credit. The Biden administration wants to revamp that $15,000 first time home buyers tax credit credit. Okay, so there's a number of other smaller proposals, but that's kind of the basics of it for individual tax. On the business, sort of big business corporate side, there's a number of proposed changes. Uh, the big one is changing the corporate tax rate from its historically low 21% up to 28%. Um, I told people when they did that, don't change your corporate structure just for the ta low tax rate. It's going to change in the future. The better strategy is to have multiple entities and you can shift the money between different entities depending on what the tax regime is. Um, but I think you'll probably see that one take place. Some other 
uh, new corporate AMT, minimum tax, global intangible tax, a bunch of stuff maybe you're not really interested in. Oh, they are proposing renewing the uh, Tesla incentive plan, uh, what I call, you know, the electric car tax credits, um, as well as reviving some renewable energy um, tax credits. But a lot of the other big business stuff for most of you that doesn't apply, um, we'll just kind of skip over some of that stuff. But the corporate tax rate going from 21 to 28, that proposal is um, would impact some people out there, some small businesses. So just kind of in summary, there's a lot of proposed changes. And just like in our investment portfolios, we recommend people stay diversified um, and be somewhat flexible in their investment strategy. The same thing with your tax strategy. I, I can't emphasize this enough. You want a flexible tax strategy. You want a diversified tax strategy. Have taxable accounts, tax deferred accounts, tax free accounts, Roth accounts, different types of accounts. You want to be prepared to accelerate income, defer income, accelerate deductions, defer deductions. Um, have some business entities, have different types of business entities, S-Corps, C-Corps, LLCs. Have a plan so that you can flex based on the, the, the regime that comes in and their tax plan. We see almost every regime that comes in changes the tax rules. And if you're locked into sort of one strategy, you put all your eggs in one tax bucket, uh, is definitely suboptimal. We need to have some, some flexibility there um, to plan. Okay, so that's it for the summary of some of the proposed tax change. Remember, these are all proposed. None of this is, is law yet. Stay tuned and, and we'll obviously keep you updated on. And then in our next couple of videos, we're gonna talk about some of the retirement planning tax changes, some of the real estate planning tax changes, as also some of the proposed estate planning tax changes. Those three, there's some big proposed changes there. So you want to make sure that you stay tuned. I think we're pretty much on a every Tuesday release schedule for these videos. Uh, so until then, I hope you have a great week and we'll uh, see you next time.